How about Revelation 10? How about we, uh, let's see here. There we go. How about we, I want to do this very quickly and then we're going to move on from the mystery. Um, in Revelation 10, uh, Revelation 10, uh, let's see here. I want to pick it up in verse 5. And um, the angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth lifted up his hand to heaven and swore by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that therein are and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea and the things which are therein that there should be time no longer but in the days of the voice of the seventh angel when he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he hath declared to his servants the prophets. Now, there's a couple of things. Well, just one more thing that I'm going to add to this mystery uh, thing. And um, if you look up on the screen, 1 Timothy 3.16, but also look uh, very quickly at 2 Thessalonians. Um, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Uh, 2 Thessalonians, 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. Yeah. Um, the mystery of iniquity, that is, yeah, right there. So, um, first place, 1 Timothy 3.16. The Bible says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Now, this pertains to the overall mystery, the overall secret. The word mystery is not found in the Old Testament. Uh, the word secret is, and there are several things in the Old Testament that were a secret. If you remember, um, Samson's mother and father were visited by an angel of the Lord. And that angel of the Lord uh, was telling Samson's mother that she was going to give birth to a, a man child. He was going to be a judge in Israel. He was going to be a Nazarite from birth. Uh, and uh, so on and so on. And so when Manoah came home, she told Manoah what was going on, and Manoah wasn't sure if he believed her, but then all of a sudden the angel appeared to him, told him pretty much the same thing. He thought he had seen uh, God, and he actually did. He saw the angel of the Lord, which was Jesus Christ. And he asked the angel of the Lord his name. And the angel said... How is it that you ask my name, seeing that it is a secret? In other words, I can't tell you what my name is. His, we find out later on that his name is Emmanuel. His name is Jesus, for he shall save his people from their, from their sins. That's what we find out in the New Testament is the name of this angel, and that is, uh, it's Jesus Christ. And... Um, so anyway, um, we have this, as part of this mystery, the identification of the Messiah, the Christ, the anointed one, the one who is going to save the world from their sins, the one who is going to bring redemption and mercy uh, to the earth, the one who is going to rule over the earth for uh, a thousand years and then for all of eternity. And so Paul writes in 1 Timothy 3.16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. And, he sa and the first thing that he says is, God was manifest in the flesh. That puts me in mind of what John chapter 1 says. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And um, by the way, if you uh, happen to uh, have a different translation of the Bible handy, uh, or you go to Blue Letter Bible uh, and look 1 Timothy 3.16 up, you'll see that they have messed with the mystery of godliness. They've messed with it. They've altered the text. Because in every new translation, NIV, New American Standard, a standard the English uh, uh, English Standard Version, the Holman Christian Standard Version, all of them say something sort of like, He appeared in a body. He appeared in a body. But it doesn't say 
who he is. It does not identify the fact that God was, God himself was manifest in the flesh. And is this important? Is this important? That, that we understand this mystery. One of the reasons why it's important is based upon what John said in 1 John. He said, he that confesseth not that Jesus hath appeared in the flesh, the same is an antichrist. And so if all of these new Bibles, these new modern translations, if none of them identify the mystery of godliness correctly by saying God was manifest in the flesh, then that tells you what spirit they are of. The spirit of Antichrist. And so God was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. Now, turn to uh, 2 Thessalonians. You're going to see the exact opposite of the mystery of godliness. We're going to see the mystery of iniquity. First, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Set this next to my doggy, doggy mess here. Don't let me forget that's under there. 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 1. Now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him that you be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter as from us, is that the day of Christ is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. That phrase is repeated, I don't know how many times in the Bible, over and over and over, the Bible is telling you, be not deceived, be not deceived, do not be deceived. Don't let yourself be deceived. There are spirits that bring about deception. Our sin, our sin is a deceiver. Our transgressions will lie to us uh, in various ways. So he says, let no man deceive you by any means. In verse 3, for that day shall not come. Except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. Meaning that no one right now knows who the Antichrist is. No one does. Don't buy anybody's book. Don't buy anybody's DVDs, videos. Don't join anybody's uh, YouTube channel where you got to pay money. In order to get the teaching on who the man of sin is. Because they don't know. He's not been revealed yet. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day shall not come. Verse 4. Who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Or that is worship. Now we have the mystery of godliness. And it specifically says God was manifest in the flesh. And let me ask you a question. Did Jesus... Believe that he himself was equal with God. Yes. And, and how do we know that? Well, that's cheating. You got to tell me the answer. How do we know that? What does the Bible say? That he, meaning Christ, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. That's the verse you were thinking of, wasn't it? Huh? Because he thought himself equal with God? Yeah. That, that was... I and the Father are one. That's another one. But he, he, thought it, it, he thought it not robbery to be equal with God. So here was God manifest in the flesh. Not just he appeared in a body. God manifest in the flesh. And here's the Antichrist. And uh, I'm going to preach. Uh, I'm going to preach from here this morning. So I'm not going to spend too much time with it. But, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Verse 4 of 2 Thessalonians uh, who opposed it and exalted themselves above all 
that is called God. He doesn't exalt himself to be equal with God. He exalts himself to be above God. And here's something that, uh, that I think is interesting. Uh, the verse in, in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The Word was God. So when it says here in 2 Thessalonians that, um, that, he oppo- that he exalts himself above all that is called God, the Word, it means that he exalts himself above the Word of God. Now, the Pope, this verse can be applied directly to the papacy. The papacy believes, uh, the popes believe it, all of the, the Catholic Church doctrine and dogma teaches it, that in any place where the Pope, when he speaks, if what he says contradicts what the Bible says, then it's the Pope that is right and the Bible is wrong. There is a group of uh, Catholic priests, cardinals, bishops, archbishops, the Pope. They all belong to a group called the Magisterium. And the Magisterium is the Word of God in the Catholic Church. The Magisterium includes the Bible, but it's not limited to the Bible. The Magisterium takes the Bible plus all of Catholic tradition. Uh, Everything that the church has decided since the A.D. 300 and on, everything that the church has said and declared to be dogma, then that is also the word of God. And again, any place where the magisterium speaks and says, this is, thus saith God, and if it contradicts the Bible, then the Bible's obviously wrong in that area and the magisterium is correct. So they exalt themselves above what is called God. Yes, sir. Yeah. The word Pope is Papa. Yep. Call him uh, when they call him Holy Father. There's only, that's only one place in the Bible and then Jesus refers to God as Holy Father. Now, let me give you another place. Something that I used to be guilty of. I used to place my intellect above the Word of God. When I would, and I would, I would do this deliberately. I used to take and, and if I had a text that I was going to preach out of, I would get my Strong's Concordance and I would look for all the Greek words that I could find related to that text. And I would try to come up with some very obscure meaning to the words that are that are in English. I would I would do this deliberately and try to come up with a meaning that is not plainly written in, in the English Bible that we have. And I did that because I wanted people to believe that I was intelligent, that I was smarter than they were, that if they didn't, if they didn't get this from me, they wouldn't have got it at all. And that I was necessary in their lives if they wanted to truly know what God really said in his word. They had to get it from me. What, what an arrogance I had. And suffice it to say that God had already worked on a way where he was going to bring me way down off of my high horse, off of my saddle, off of my arrogance, uh, just about killed me doing it. 
But God brought me down from that. And I have since then made every attempt to make that to make my mind subject to the word of God and not the word of God subject to my mind or to my intellect. Lots and lots of preachers do exactly what I just told you that I used to do. They may have done it for the same reason I did. They may have differing reasons why they do it. But I know for a fact that they do it. You don't have to listen to a sermon too long until that preacher is going to go. Now, in the original Greek, it, a, a better translation of this is, and what they do is they have placed their mind and their intellect above what is called God or what is worshipped. And it happens a lot. God can still bring them out. He brought me out, and I'm thankful that he did because uh, I probably wouldn't be around if, if God hadn't have done it. So I'm very thankful that he did. Uh, in verse 5 here, Remember ye not that when I was with, yet with you, I told you these things, and now you know what withholdeth, that ye might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity doth already work. That spirit of Antichrist, the mystery of iniquity. Uh, only, he, only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way, and then shall that wicked be revealed. So the mystery of iniquity, I see it as like the opposite of the mystery of godliness. This is the revelation of the Antichrist and who it is. Then that wicked shall be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie. And uh, people, anchor your mind, your intellect, your reasoning, your heart. Anchor it to the word of God that you stray not away from God's word and God's principles and God's doctrines. Amen to that. Now. Um, look at Revelation 17 very quickly. There is an alternative spirit to God's Holy Spirit. When you th think about it, God's Holy Spirit um, is seen in the, the candlestick that's in the tabernacle, and it has seven candles to it. And those seven candles are the seven spirits of God. And you find those seven spirits of God in Revelation chapter 11, verse 2. Um, the opposite of those seven spirits is the seven heads of the beast and the woman who sits on that beast. That woman is, her first name is Mystery. So in verse 1, there came one of the seven angels which had the seven vials and talked with me, saying unto me, Come hither, I will show unto thee the judgment of the great whore that sitteth upon many waters, with whom the kings of the earth have committed fornication, and the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet-colored beast, full of names of blasphemy, here it is, having seven heads... And, and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in purple and scarlet color and decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, having a golden cup in her hand full of abominations and filthiness of her fornication. I will submit to you that the number one issue that the 21st century church 21st century denominations that practically every church and every denomination and every uh, every spiritual work in this world right now, the number one sin that they have to deal with is fornication. Pastor after pastor after pastor after pastor being caught up 
in sins of adultery. Pastor is being caught up in some of the most heinous, I won't even mention them, heinous sins of fornication that could be done. Uh, it's, this is happening not just in America. It's happening everywhere. When I go to Kenya and I talk to the pastors out there, that's what I hear from them. Is that they have pastors that uh, they, a lot of the pastors in Kenya, the bad guys, they will hold great power over their people. And they will use that power to violate the women of their church or violate the children of that church. And when caught, when exposed, uh, when confronted about this, uh, the pastor has convinced those people that he can do no wrong or in some cases that uh, he can do wrong and it's okay. God will forgive him like he does everybody else and it'll be okay and he can still be the pastor. And this goes on in a lot of places around the world, especially in America. Pastor after pastor being caught up in the sin of fornication. Uh, so anyway, that's the cup that she has. Verse 5 says, And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth. And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration. And the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her. Wherever the beast is, that's where she is. Wherever she is, that's where the beast is. Which hath um, this seven heads and ten horns. And again, I think the seven heads are, that we know that there are seven kings. We know there are seven mountains. Mountains uh, are, are indicative of kingdoms themselves. But I also believe that these seven heads represent seven different uh, demons, seven different spirits, seven different devils, and so on. Remember Mary Magdalene. What, what did she have cast out of her? How many? That was a good guess. That was a good guess. But it was right. She had seven devils inside of her, and Jesus cast them all out. Um, in the practice of kundalini yoga. By the way, don't do yoga. Don't do it. You are, you're not exercising. You are participating in a ritual that is in, in itself a religious ritual. The word yoga means yoke. And what it means is, is that when you, <clears throat> when you practice and participate in this yoga, that you will have the power to empty your mind and become what they call mindfulness, which is a, it's, an, it's not an oxymoron, but yet maybe it is. It means the opposite of what it says. Mindfulness is the exact opposite of your mind being full of thoughts. It's your mind being completely empty of all thoughts. And they call it mindfulness. I, I, guess, I guess so they can get it past people. But anyway, that mind emptiness um, is when you get to that place, that's when devils will begin to speak to you, begin to... Uh, give you commandments, give you, give you things that they want you to do. You have opened yourself up to them and your life. Now you're in trouble is what you are. You are in trouble. You may not recognize it, but you are in serious trouble. And it all comes about by way of just as I would not want you to have a Ouija board in your house. I wouldn't want you to do yoga. If you want to exercise, get out an old Jack LaLanne tape. Who remembers Jack LaLanne? 
Yeah. Get out an old Jack LaLanne video or uh, who has it just died? Richard Simmons. If you can stand that whiny voice of his, get, get his and exercise. But don't do yoga. It's, it's kundalini. That's, a, that's an Indian Sanskrit word. And basically, you're trying to open up your third eye so that you're illuminated. Okay? And, and the issue is, in kundalini yoga, they say that you have a, a beast, a serpent, coiled up at the base of your spine. Through the practice of kundalini yoga, you release that serpent to go up the 33 bones of your spine and pass through what's called the seven chakras, which they say are seven energy vortexes that are in your body. What those energy vortex vortexes are, are devils. And with each one of those, you are empowering those devils to have power over you. Don't do it. You want to exercise? Exercise. You want to get in contact with God? Fall upon your face and pray and pray and pray until you've reached heaven. You want to hear from God? Open up your Bible and read it. It's that simple. Amen? All right, I'm going to move on. Now, go back to Revelation 10. John wants to eat that book. He's looking at it like a preacher would look at a donut. Hmm. I had some donuts yesterday. Uh, verse 9. I went unto the angel and said unto him, Give me the little book. And he said unto me, Take it and eat it up. And it shall make thy belly bitter, but it shall be in thy mouth sweet as honey. And I took the little book out of the angel's hand and ate it up. And it was in my mouth sweet as honey. And as soon as I had eaten it, my belly was bitter. And he said unto me, Thou must prophesy again before many peoples and nations and tongues and kings. What do you think the, the angel here, what do you think he meant by, if when you eat this, you're going to prophesy before peoples, nations, tongues and kings. What do you think he meant by that? Okay. But how was John going to be preaching to many peoples, nations, tongues, and kings? How was John? John is in uh, captivity on the Isle of Patmos. He's in, he's in jail, in other words. He's in uh, home prison. And they're not going to let him off that island. How is it that John is going to preach to all these people? It's actually rather simple. There you go. It's in the Bible. John has just been told that what he's writing down is not just for those seven churches. It's for everybody. The number four indicating uh, the, the, the gospel. In other words, wherever the gospel goes, the book of Revelation is going. You're going to prophesy before peoples, nations, tongues, and kings. Now, what you've just seen here is the method of which uh, John and other people, it's the method by which they can prophesy to people all over the world. In other words, John ate the book. It tasted sweet like honey. When he got in his belly, it made his belly bitter because with the word of God, there's both. There is the sweetness of the word of God. There is the bitterness and harshness of the word of God. There are things that I love to say to everybody. There are also things that I dread 
having to say, because I know that it might bring sorrow, it might bring controversy, it might bring, um, with some people, they might think, uh, I, that's it, that Brother Mike, I'm not, I can't listen to more of you. Uh, we're going to go, we're going to stay at home, start listening to Charles Stanley or whoever. Um, that happens probably with every true blue Bible believing preacher is that they enjoy the sweetness of the word of God, but they have to give out the bitterness as well. And no, none of them, the good ones, none of us like it, but we have to do it. It's the job. That's something that God really, really reinforced in me years ago uh, was part of the job. Anyway, we'll pick this up uh, next week because what you just read here concerning John, the exact same thing happened with Ezekiel and we'll find out why. Father, we ask your blessings now upon your word. Thank you, Father, for uh, enlightening our eyes. Father, teach us these mysteries. Show us, dear God, what they are, even so much the more as we see the day approaching. I pray, Father, Lord, that these mysteries would be opened up to us we would know, Lord, and not be deceived as these days grow ever darker. We ask this blessing now in Jesus' name, and amen.